between Hitler's government and a group of Zionist leaders in 1933. The agreement called for the transfer of 55,000 Jews and $100 million to Palestine in exchange for calling off a planned economic boycott of Nazi Germany by Jewish organizations. Barnes & Noble booksellers in Rockville, Maryland host the hour-long event. So we're here with Edwin Black and uh... Uh, most, most people know you for some of the bestsellers, some of the books that uh, Mitchell has just referred to. IBM, The Holocaust, War Against the Weak, Internal Combustion, Banking on Baghdad. All of these books, bestsellers, were written, however, in the 21st century. Um, you have, I understand, somewhere around 69 different editions, uh, published in about 14 languages in 61 countries. The question that we're focusing on today was actually your first book called The Transfer Agreement, the dramatic story of the pact between the Third Reich and Jewish Palestine. This book was published in 1984, so it's been 25 years ago. Um, and at the time that it came out, I remember there was a tremendous amount of uh, media attention, and also it was a very controversial book. It was uh, one that there was a tremendous amount of discussion about it, and so that's really what brings us here today. Um, can you, let's go first to that issue. What was it about the publication of this book and the, the, the thesis that you were putting forth, what was it that garnered so much attention and so much controversy? The story of the transfer agreement is the story of the pact between the Zionists and the Nazis that was uh, launched uh, in the first weeks of the Third Reich in 1933. Uh, it began uh, in the spring of 1933 and was consummated in uh, August of 1933. Most people don't know that when Hitler came to power, the Jews actually fought back, and they fought back hard, and they fought back immediately. Uh, Hitler came to power on January 30th, 1933. The first concentration camp was uh, actually on, uh, opened up a, a, a series of them between March 8th and March 10th of 1933. The anti-Jewish laws followed shortly thereafter. And by March 27th of 1933, the Jewish war veterans uh, had actually um, started uh, a series of international protests and, mar and marches. And on March 27th of 1933, one million protesters jammed Madison Square Garden, and there were uh, uh, boycott and protest movements all over the globe, led by the Jews, but certainly involving, uh, but certainly involving um, the uh, interfaith community, the labor unions, anyone who wanted to profit at Germany's expense and to protest the Nazi regime. So we're talking, this is about 10, 12 years before the onset of, of, onset of, of, of uh, World War II. Uh, 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 World War II began at 6 a.m. on uh, September 30th, 1939. So, right, right. so we're talk, uh, Hitler came to power in 33, the Nuremberg Laws in 35, uh, Kristallnacht in 1938, the war in 1939, and most of the genocidal uh, period, the so-called final solution, I guess, would have begun in the summer of 1941, the fall of, nine, of, nine, of 1941, and then commencing at full speed in 1943, 4, and 5. Um, so what the Zionists did was they realized that protest was fruitless. Let's take a moment. Let's be sure we define Zionists. Those are the people who, what were they doing? The Zionists? I believe that most people don't know what the word Zionism so let's, means. Let's start with that. Well, at the end of the uh, 19th century, there were a number of nationalistic movements across Europe. There was uh, the concept of Armenian nationalism. There was uh, East European nationalism. The Ottoman Empire was falling apart. There was a wide group of people who were uh, seeking to self-govern. To, to self One of these many groups was the uh, Jewish pe was the Jewish pe uh, Jewish people, okay. and Zionism is nothing more than Jewish nationalism. So the, we're talking the Jewish nationalists, the Jewish nationalists, okay. the Zionists, seeking to legally uh, uh, organize themselves into a state under international law, which was done through the League of Nations. Okay. Um, sought to uh, move the Jews who were persecuted, especially in Europe into Jewish Palestine. Most people t today 
think of Palestinians as Arabs. But the entire world mm -hmm. in 1933 thought the word Palestinian meant Jewish Refer nationalist, the Jews, right. Zionist. The Jewish Agency for Palestine, the Palestine Post, Jewish Palestine. That's why the subtitle of the book is Jewish Palestine, be, sure. be, because that was the body of the Jews in what, what, what became the State of Israel. It was called Jewish Palestine, and the term for the Jews, internationally recognized in ordinary parlance and officially, was Palestinian. Palestinians. So they used to refer to Jews as, pal as Palestinians. So these Zionists, who were the advocates then for a Jewish homeland, pick up our story in terms of the They controversy. saw the end before anyone saw the end. Mm -hmm. And they said, the only thing that we can do to save a remnant, because they saw it coming, they knew the history of the Jews, the recent history and the distant history, they saw it coming, and they made a deal with the Reich to transfer out the Jews of Nazi Germany and other parts of Europe into Palestine. Now, how are you going to do that? That's going to be impossible, because who's running Palestine? Palestine is being run by the British, it is being run under the so-called mandate system, which means the League of Nations man mandated Palestine, which was Turkish territory mm -hmm. before that, uh, to be a uh, Jewish homeland. But there were rules in place. And the rules, and this is important, the rules were that Jews could not enter Palestine right. without $5,000 in cash or 1,000 uh, British pounds. And this was called the so-called capitalist immigration certificate. Now, how does a Jew leave Nazi Germany, where there are currency restrictions, where no one can bring a Reichmark out of Germany? How does that Jew get into Palestine as a so-called official refugee? The answer is the Germans concocted the idea, and the Zionists concocted it with them, that German goods would be sold. And as German goods were sold, money would be produced. A Jew in Germany, in this complex arrangement, would take his personal household possessions and assets and put them in a special bank. Mm -hmm. And that bank was called Pal Troy. Then a second bank was set up called the Anglo-Palestine Bank, and that bank was in Palestine. The money would be put into the German bank, the Nazi goods would be sold by the Zionist organization across the Middle East and especially in Palestine. When the goods were sold, they generated revenue when, which went into the Anglo-Palestine Bank. The Anglo-Palestine Bank then provided the money for the Jews to bypass the currency restriction that the British had imposed and they would come in. In the process, the Nazis could restore their economy. The Nazis could break the boycott because you could not transfer a Jew <coughs> by selling the goods and at the same time boycott the goods. The infrastructure of Jewish Palestine was built up. Pipes, steel, breweries, homes, cars, buses, all of these, these things German made. And I wondered when I first went to Israel, why are there so many Mercedes-Benz running Everybody around? Everybody asked that question. We, we all sure. asked that right. question. Right. And that's where I really start. Well, I, is that what got you interested in, the to in, in this topic? No, what actually got me interested in is that we'll actually get okay. to that in a little bit. It was, a, it was the right, we'll Martians come back to that. in Let's Skokie. stay with what you're talking about. I think. Go ahead. So I wrote this book and explained how it happened. And in the process, 25 years ago, I was the first one to talk about the economic consequences of the Holocaust. Hmm. At that time, people said, why are you talking assets? They were still trying to comprehend the enormity, uh, the scope of the bloodshed. How many people died? How many people were gassed? How many trains were, were there? People were not talking about money. Now, today, that dominates the conversation as assets. I want my property back. I want my insurance back. I want all these things back. Sure. But in those days, it was all almost blasphemous. It was a, a few decades ahead of its time to discuss the money consequences. But I, real, I realized that the scope of the bloodshed was in many ways linked 
to the economic impact of the Holocaust. In addition, I was the first one to use the word Nazi and Zionist in the same sentence. Mm -hmm. Now it is today everywhere, mm -hmm. especially by the enemies of the Jewish state. But the fact is, the fact is at, that, at that time, it was completely unexpected. And so that's why the book was extremely controversial. That's why there, uh, the um, media jumped on it. I went on a giant tour, and even though I did my best to convey the information as best as I could, it was quite shocking. And so we have um, uh, people hiring psychologists to go on uh, television and analyze me. Did, did people assume you were saying there was a sense of cooperation between the Nazis and the Zionists, and that was part of what then uh, was so disturbing? Well, Is they were trying saying? to say that um, I was blaming the Jews. Right for their very own fate instead That's of seeing right. uh, this whole elaborate scheme and and in terms of, of in how terms of a rescue got it in fact i had a problem with my own parents who were survivors from the train to treblinka and forest fires who thought that i was perhaps revealing something that should not be revealed um, as I said, I do remember uh, the storm of controversy, and there were articles coming out, and this and that, and uh, 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 and yet here we are today, and and it seems as if the Jewish community is is now much more open to it, to to this. Well, discussion. they're open to it be, because, uh, um, uh, of course, I've been established in the Jewish com community. My credentials uh, of fighting for Jewish causes and for justice right. in 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 Holocaust matters is now well established. Uh, Back when I wrote this book originally, yeah. the American Zionist or the Zionist or Organization of, of America canceled the publication of their um, magazine, the American Zionist, on press because they had a cover story about ab wow. about this topic. Today, Mort Klein of the American uh, of, of the ZOA mm -hmm. uh, has uh, read the book and uh, endorsed it as uh, sensitive. So, do you want to share with us then? How what took you into this uh, line of research? This was your first book, right? Uh, uh, this was my first book, right. and prior to that, I had been um, a local investigative reporter. I had done some international uh, undercover investigations. Uh, um, I was involved in an undercover operation on a, uh, the last slave state in the middle of the Indian Ocean. Uh, and when I did, and when I did that. Um, uh, my agent, uh, uh, an agent approached me from William Morris and said, we want you to write a book for us. What are the top five books you'd like to write? And okay. I said, well, the one book, I gave him all sorts of ideas. Right. I said, the one book that is uh, too hot to handle is the transfer agreement. What really motivated me to get in, be involved in this was the Skokie March. Mm, tell us about that. Yeah. Well, I think I was fundamentally naive. I fundamentally, I was in such a cloistered, typical Jewish neighborhood environment that I couldn't understand how Jews could operate against their uh, perceived self-interest. And during the Skokie March, I interviewed the Jewish attorney for the Nazis. Right. I said, how, how can you do this? And at that time, I was schooled by a Professor Byron Sherwin of Spurtis College sure. who said there are many things we can't understand. And he told me there was something called the transfer agreement. I didn't believe it. And uh, finally, I assembled a team of uh, 20 or 30 uh, historians and uh, Holocaust survivors and children of Holocaust survivors. There was no second generation movement. Mm -hmm. We went um, into uh, five or six countries, uh, accumulated all of the information. Some of it was not even in the archive. It was under people's desks. It was being protected. I went into the Jewish agency. I went into the Leo Beck Institute. Uh, and I found the information, so, I assembled it, and I produced the book. So you're taking us to, to the uh, process of putting it together. Um, it's important to, to stop for a moment because the, the uh, elaborate way in which the scheme was structured and then to try and uncover it, and just what you've referred to right now, um, at a time pre-Internet, uh, access uh, to, to that kind of information uh, must have been quite extraordinary. So uh, maybe you could shed for our, our listeners a little something about um, the uh, nature of that, the research that went into it and putting together a team to pull all this information together. There was no internet. There were no computers. The manuscript was typed. Hmm. And every change, time I changed a footnote, they had to retype the entire oh, manuscript. It was retyped 30 times. Wow. Uh, by the way, on an IBM Selectric. <laughs> uh, 
so I was using the, the best IBM equipment even back then. Um, I did this in the, um, in the, in the late 70s and early 80s. Um, we had to assemble everything by hand. Uh, we did everything by uh, uh, carbon paper and by a photocopy. There were very few Xerox places in Israel. It was hard to make a copy. Mm -hmm. But we assembled a team and uh, we had all these meetings and we found the information. Most people didn't know what we were looking for. And at one point I ran into an archivist who, in Israel who seemed to know where all the files were hidden. And I said to him, how is it that you know so much about this? He says, I was in the, I was in the transfer agreement. Wow. And the, the word transfer in, he, in Hebrew is havara, mm -hmm. which means transfer. Transfer Limited, Havara Limited, was the name of the overall company. And you must remember, this was encouraged by the Nazis, cooperated with by the Nazis, and the Nazis and the Zionists actually worked together because they had an intersecting interest. The Nazis wanted the Jews out of, Palest uh, out of Germany. The Zionists wanted them into Palestine. The Nazis wanted to seize German assets, German Jewish assets. The Zionists wanted to save German Jewish assets, and the only way they could do it was by this transfer agreement. So the Nazis were willing to work with Jews on this? Is that what you're saying? That's uh, right. Uh, but their desire was to, to ultimately to exterminate the Jewish people. So was this before they had gone down that path, or uh, it just it was, it was serving their greater interest? Explain that to us a little bit. Understanding the Nazi period for real is understanding a complex sit, uh, uh, set of situations. Uh, it was actually Byron Sherwin from Spurtis College who schooled me on the new approach to understanding both the reality and the perception of reality. And the perception of reality often dict dictates the, the real set of facts that occur on the ground. And, can, and, uh, and tumbling down the road. The Nazis saw working with the, with the Zionists as the best, most expedient way to stop the boycott and to get the Jews out of Germany. Where were they going to go? They were going to go to Palestine. Now, there's another train of thought here. Mm -hmm. The Nazis believed in something called Volkisch thought. That means ethnic primacy, okay. and they believed that the um, uh, that the Germans had the Volkish primacy in Europe, and they thought that the Jews needed to go to Palestine, quote, where they belonged. And so you had uh, the uh, uh, fantastical idea of um, of uh, Goebbels and others publicly endorsing Jewish emigration to Palestine. The Nazis actually struck a coin with a Jewish star on one side and a swastika on, uh, on the other. Mm -hmm. While all the Jewish organizations were shut down, the Zionists were allowed to maintain their operation and were allowed to grow. But you must understand, when the Zionists published their newspaper, they had Nazi censors in the office sure. overlooking every line. People don't understand exactly what the nature of the invasive Nazi regime was. It, it is easy to say they could have fought back, and on many levels people did fight back. But what the Zionists did is they were the realists, the cold, hard realists. Mm -hmm. So, so let's talk about within the context of the Jewish community then, um, and 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 the response because you're bringing up some important issues here. Uh, people, there's a lot of misunderstanding. Um, did were, were Jews passive? Were they uh, resistant? Um, you alluded a little while ago to the nature of a, of, a, of an anti-Nazi boycott. Um, so, uh, if you could just share with us a little bit about the uh, 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 the backlash and what the Jewish community was trying to do uh, in response to the uh, early uh, uh, rise to Hitler's early rise to power. Okay, we need to look at this as two titanic forces: the boycott to cripple the Reich and the transfer effort to save the Jews. 
They seem to be on competing, uh, 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 parallel competing tracks here, yes? Uh, no, they are on a collision course. Cl that's what I meant, collision course. Okay. They're on a collision course because they cannot coexist. Right. The boycott movement did what had to be done. The Jews condemned the Nazis. They had million-man marches. Um, uh, there was uh, a boycott in every city. Uh, it was led by the American Jewish Congress. By Stephen Wise, a famous name in Jewish history, there were rogue boy, there were rogue boycotts, organized boycotts. And these were saying to all Americans as well as Jews. No, it wasn't but just Americans. Saying, it was in Czech, it was in Czechoslovakia, it was in England, it was in France. Saying don't buy go, goods coming out of Don't buy German goods and services. Was there opposition to that, by the way, boycott, or, or was there? Yes, there was opposition within the American Jewish community. It's very easy for people who look at the American Jewish community t today. And, be, and falsely believe it's monolithic. But you and I both know uh, that the Jewish community back in the 30s was anything but monolithic. Sure. It's a very complex story. But the Jewish community was comprised, w w the Jewish leadership in, in this country was mainly run by what were known as German Jews, Hof Juden, which is the courtly Jews. They didn't want to rock the boat so much. Not only did they not rock the boat, they had led all the vigorous boycotts and protests against the Tsar, mm -hmm. against France, against uh, uh, D Damascus. They were the ones who fought back whenever Jews were persecuted. And whether or not the regime in question, the Tsar, would take retaliation or revenge upon the inhabitants was never an issue. They always had to stand up for Jewish rights. Okay. And they successfully defended Jewish rights all over the planet. In this case, the Jews who would be retaliated against were not some Russian guy called Sasha. Mm. This would now be their uncle Heinrich, their cousin, their daughter, it would hit so home. So they were afraid there would be a backlash against Jews in Germany, and some were counseling, wait a minute, we should back off on this. Yes, and who am I talking about? Let's get names. American Jewish Committee. They were anti-Zionist. Mm -hmm. In those days. In those days, not now, of course. And B'nai B'rith, anti-Zionist, and uh, also German Jewish in its uh, major composition. And these guys wanted to work quietly, behind the scenes, petitioning government officials. They wanted nothing to do with any vigorous protest against Nazi Germany. Contrast that with the other Jewish organization, not the committees and the elite, but the democratic Jewish people. And that was the uh, Eastern Jews, the so-called American Jewish Congress. It's really like labor and management. Sure. It was really the the, pop, the population against the elite and the population said we're going to protest this we're going to not and what did they have to pro to protest what was the weapon that the average Jew had to fight Hitler the money in their pocket that was it and not not to use it for Nazi goods in Germany. and not to use it for Nazi goods now at the same time when are we talking about the height of the depression mm -hmm. so if you're going to boycott uh, uh, German pharmaceuticals and China and film and um, uh, other uh, uh, goods and services for Czechoslovakian, French, American. Lots of people are going to join that. Labor unions, the uh, Czechoslovakians, Catholics who were, out, who were outraged by what was being done in Germany, Protestants. This was interracial, this was non-sectarian. True, it was led by the Jews, but they were very careful to be all inclusive and never call this a Jewish boy, a Jewish Let's boy. Let's also God. keep in mind there's also the nativist movement in the America in the 1930s. That's right. Uh, the Jewish community was nowhere near as well organized or as, as willing to uh, take positions as they are today, advocating on behalf of their fellow Jews, in part because of everything you've mentioned here. In some way, did this boycott feed into Jewish notion, uh, German Nazi notions about Jewish power? That was the power of the boycott. You never measure a boycott in nickels and dimes or, fe or fennigs and marks. Mm -hmm. You measure a boycott in ergs of fear. Okay. How afraid are you of the boycott? And were they? Were the Germans? The Nazis believed in Jewish boycotts. Mm -hmm.
The Nazis believed in, in, in an international Jewish conspiracy which controlled money and markets. Adolf Hitler personally lionized his hero, who was his hero, Henry Ford. Mm. And what brought Henry Ford down? A Jewish boycott run by the American Jewish Committee and B'nai B'rith and the Congress against uh, the Ford Motor Company, and this was vividly in the minds of the Nazis. So the Nazis believed in the boycott almost as much as the boycotters believed in the, in the, boy, in the boycott. If anyone comes to you with statistics, they don't know what they're talking about. Because it's fear, it's economic fear that ruled the economy and the relations. So, with how boycott. does this transfer agreement play into that backdrop of the boycott? Without the boycott, the Nazis would have seen no necessity to work with the transfer agreement. Without the ch so, in that way, the boycott succeeded to kind of like succumb and go around it, so to speak. That's right. You? By by subverting the boy the uh, the boycott, they could do the transfer agreement. The transfer agreement succeeded. Um, uh, because it did bring the Jews out of, Palis uh, out of Germany into mm -hmm. Palestine, created a Jewish state, and had that not occurred, no one has a doubt what, it, what would have been the fate of those Jews. Were there other areas of cooperation, by the way, uh, between the Nazis and, and, and Palestine at that time? Yes, there were. There were undercurrents. E economic cooperation. Yes, right. none of this is simple. This was complex, and that's why I spent five years putting it all to, together. Jewish Palestine was half agrarian, if not mostly agrarian, at that time in the sure. 1930s. The Jews did not own much of the land, uh, which they did buy with transfer agreement money. They did not have a big infrastructure, but they had farms. And what was the biggest product? I'm going to guess oranges, was it? Oranges was the big, was the big product of Jewish Palestine. It was the economic wherewithal. Mm -hmm. Who was the number one customer for oranges from Jewish Palestine? Mm. Nazi Germany. Mm. So, now Jewish Palestine, which uh, was, of course, abruptly surprised on January 30th with the uh, takeover by Adolf Hitler, Jewish Palestine is now looking at their number one customer, which is the which is the Third Reich, and if those oranges are not purchased, there can be no economic vitality for the um, uh, for Jewish Palestine. And there was the constant threat by uh, the Third Reich: we won't buy Jewish or oranges from Palestine; we'll buy fascist oranges from Spain. Valencia's. So this is one of the important un un undercurrents. It's easy to see this in black and white. My challenge, and the challenge of history, is to see the complex grays that established this very murky picture. Well, let's go to some of those complex things, because obviously, just even toes which you touched upon so far, this was not a simple kind of a thing. It sounds like there's a lot of moving and shifting and, 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 and uh, maneuvering going on uh, in terms of international merchandise, purchase and sales. So can you share with us then, uh, uh, what were the uh, uh, dynamics of the transfer agreement? What was the you know, uh, uh, essence of it? Okay. It, it starts out with uh, a Jew in, in Germany taking his money and putting it into a blocked account. Okay. Now, Reichmarks were hard to identify. They had dozens of different types of Reichmarks and Reichmark values. But generally speaking, across all of these uh, fictitious and real Mark systems, it was about 5,000 Reich, Reich, Reichmarks would equal the amount due. The Jew would put his money into a blocked account, a spare canto, and that account would be fundamentally a uh, trustee account. And that would be run by this bank in Germany. Then they would sell goods. They would sell pipes. They would sell taxis. They would sell it in Palestine. They would sell it in Lebanon. They would sell it in Turkey. They had all different types of commercial distribution for German goods. When the money was uh, 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 made available, the money was deposited in a second bank. The name of that bank was the Anglo-Palestine Bank. Okay. The Anglo-Palestine Bank renamed itself after the State of Israel was established, and the name is now Bank Lumi. Same bank. Anglo-Palestine Bank would take that money, 
credit through an international clearinghouse, the, uh, the uh, German um, trust fund. The German trust fund would issue uh, the um, foreign currency of 1,000 British pounds. A capitalist certificate would be given to the German Jew, and that German Jew would then come across, and in many times he came across with replicas of his own home. He came across with carpets. He came across with, um, uh, with uh, building materials. He came across with cars. He came across with musical in instruments. And suddenly, there was a massive German Jewish and infrastructural and economic infusion into Jewish Palestine. So let me ask you. Uh, it's complex. Okay, leaving aside the complexity, let me just ask a simple question then. Was this then uh, uh, a situation whereby the Jewish community and somehow was contributing to the Nazi efforts and, and, and helping to finance what it is that they wanted to be able to do. Yeah, 